morning, everyone. If you have a Bible, open up or pull it up on your phones to 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. While you're turning there, if you're newer to the church and you have teenagers, uh, the reason we wanted to do the youth camp video so early is just so you can mark your calendars. This is a great way to get to know other kids, teenagers in the church and in our area. And this is a, a one that you can invite friends to. So uh, those of you who have friends in the area, please bring them. Um, those of you who have grandchildren in the area, you can invite them as well. Um, we want this to be open to all and that is going to be in June. Lord willing, COVID will have lifted enough to be able to safely gather. Amen to that. Absolutely. So we are in 2 Peter today. Uh, let me pray and then we'll jump in. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that your word is the only certain truth that we have. Lord, and we want to be a people that is shaped and molded by your word. Holy Spirit, would you help us today to be further shaped and molded by your holy word. I ask for your help to preach it today. We ask this in your name. Amen. Well, this morning, we are heading back to our series in 2 Peter. If you remember long ago, around Thanksgiving time, a little bit earlier, we were finishing up a series on 2 Peter called This World Is Not Our Home, and we got derailed for a number of reasons, and now we are back on track. So Lord willing, today we're going to cover chapter 2, and then next week Jason Rummel is going to finish up in chapter 3. Well, if you were here last Sunday, we heard an outstanding message on the Great Commission by my friend Scott Rising, who is planning a church in Greensburg. And he did a great job preaching from the book of Matthew on the Great Commission. So if you were here or you watched it online last week, I want you to think of that sermon as if it was a sports practice. So kind of weird, but think of it if last Sunday was football practice or basketball practice. If it was a practice, last week the primary thing that we learned was offense. We talked all about making disciples, all about you could say in sports, scoring points, getting touchdowns, advancing as uh, against our opponent. And that's what Scott did a great job preaching about. And that's a super important part of being a Christian. We are called to the mission of making disciples. And we want to be bold and aggressive in that mission. And so if you're into sports, just think offense. Well, this morning's message is going to be about defense. So if, if today is another practice, and I get to be your coach for a day, we are going to be all about defense. Now, defense often is not as glamorous in most people's minds as offense. And you think of ESPN, occasionally you'll see a great defensive play on the highlight reel, but often it's primarily offensive plays. But a healthy Christian and a healthy local church needs to have a mixture of both, an awareness of biblical offense and biblically, biblical defense. So today, we're going to be on the defensive end because that's where uh, Peter is as he writes this letter. So the title today is Be on Guard Against False Teachers. Be on guard. Be on defense against false teachers teachers. By way of reminder, 2 Peter is a really short letter. You can read it today. It's three chapters long, and the primary purpose was for Peter to remind Christians of how to navigate this world and all the, the things that they have being Christians in Christ. They have power to navigate this confusing world, and then in chapter 2, he devotes an entire chapter to the reality of false teachers that are going to infiltrate the ranks. And so he wants them to be aware and prepared. And we learn in chapter 1 of this letter that the Apostle Peter knows that he is about to die. And so he, he's, he's doing his best through the inspiration of the Spirit 
writing and appealing to those he knows he will not see much longer. Uh, most scholars believe this was written maybe in the last year or two or less of Peter's life. And so you think about it, if you knew your death was on the horizon and you wanted to prepare people, you would be very focused and very um, precise in the words that you would use and the subjects that you, you would use. Not only that, but he is doing this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And the big idea he wants us to be aware of is to be aware of false teachers. Beware of those who teach things that are contrary to what is taught in this book. Beware of their teaching and beware of their conduct and their appeal to your sinful passions. So one of the things we're going to see this morning is one of the traits of a false teacher certainly is teaching false things. But another trait is that they appeal to our sinful desires and passions. Well, yeah, you heard you shouldn't do that as a Christian, but I think it's okay. That kind of thing. We're going to get into the details of that today. So to be a healthy Christian, we got to be both thinking about offense, sharing the gospel and making disciples, and defense, learning this book well and guarding against those who come against the truth of God's word. We're going to look at six traits this morning of false teachers. Trait number one, false teachers are slippery and deceptive. False teachers, those who teach things that are contrary to the Bible, are slippery and deceptive. And when Peter's thinking about false teachers, he's thinking about those who are in and among Christians. So he's not just thinking about people that have all kinds of different ideas about things, but he's talking about those who are among us in Christian circles who are seeking to confuse and even at worst destroy people's faith in Christ. So we're going to start at 2 Peter, uh, actually chapter 1, the last verse, verse 21. He said, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. But false prophets also arose among the people. So he's talking about the Old Testament people, the people of Israel. They had true prophets who spoke on behalf of the Lord, and they had false prophets. Then he says, just as there will be false teachers among you. So we're not going to be any different than Israel in the Old Testament. There was true prophets, and there was false prophets. In the New Testament era which we're in, there will be faithful Bible teachers who seek to study God's Word and live God's Word, and then there will be counterfeits that seek to distract and even destroy. He says, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, teaching things that are contrary to Scripture, even denying the Master who bought them. So they claim to be with Christ, but they deny the very Christ they claim to be with, bringing upon themselves a swift destruction, and many will follow their sensuality, their, their passions and desires, their, their sinful passions and desires. And because of them, the way of the truth will be blasphemed. They will speak against the truth of God's Word, either by their words and their teaching or by their conduct, but often by both. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. So we'll see that greed and the love of money becomes a, a, a strong motivation for some of these false teachers. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. So Peter, he wants us to know that, let's say, the best false teachers are those that come in secretly. And they're as slippery as a bar of soap. You try to pin them down. You try to grab a hold of them. What do you really believe? You grab it and it just squirts right out of your hand. You just, you just can't nail them down because they're, they're slippery. And we learn right at the outset of this chapter, and we'll see this throughout the chapter, that God sees all this, knows all this. They will deal with the living God and their consequences. 
But as Christians, we need to be on guard. We need to know God's Word from front to back. We need to study. We need to encourage one another to stay in God's Word and not be taken away by every wind of teaching and doctrine that that comes your way. Think of it this way. If I told you today that, hey, guess what, guys? This morning, I had breakfast with some aliens and we ate some eggs and some bacon. It was a great time. And they told me around noon today, they're all coming back, at least for Saving Grace Church. That's what they told me. And all we got to do is just stand out in the parking lot and wave like this. Now, if I told you that, that's not true, okay? So I would be a false teacher. But it wouldn't persuade any of you. You'd be like, uh, he lost it. He's, he's gone cuckoo. He's, he's out to lunch. It would not be at all effective to persuade you. And if you're in the room or watching online and you're looking for a new church, you just think, well, it's not that one. <laughs> Check Saving Grace Church off the box. See, that, that's not very effective. But let me read you a letter that came to my house um, a few weeks ago. This is a handwritten letter addressed to my wife. And uh, here's what it said. I'm not going to read the woman's name who wrote it. Dear Mary, hello, my name is, we'll call her Beth. I volunteer my time to encourage people from the Bible. That sounds good, right? Um, The lady goes on to say, we see so much bad things happening in our world, not just to us personally, but to those we love around us. Perhaps you have personally found this to be true. So... Sure, Mary's reading this letter. Found that to be true. It's a wild time we live in. Have you ever considered what our future will bring? So now she asks a thoughtful question. And have you ever thought about what is needed to bring about better conditions in our world? And so the letter goes on, and and it turns out this woman is a Jehovah's Witness, and she gives a Jehovah's Witness track and, and directs Mary to a Jehovah's Witness website. What sounds really nice, and I'm sure she's a really kind lady, but she's pointing to something that is not true. See, if you go on the Jehovah's Witness website or you do any research at all, the Jesus of the Bible is not the Jesus of their religion. The the way to salvation is not the way that is found in the Bible. Their, their understanding of human nature and who goes to heaven is not what is described in the Bible. And see, that kind of thing is much more slippery than me telling you I had breakfast with aliens this morning. And so they quote the Bible, but then they bring in another source that is greater than the Bible and superior to the Bible. And there is no other source that is greater than the Bible or superior to the Bible. And the best way to be guarded against those kind of things is to know the Bible, is to spend time in God's Word day after day, being devoted to it. And I know for some of you either watching or in the room, you might be brand new Christians. I know we have a number of them right now, which we are thrilled about. And you don't have to be fearful of this. If you just start with some basic ideas of, let me give you some examples. So if you are dealing with Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons, here's a a few things that can get right to the crux of what is true in the Bible and what is false in their teaching. The first is, what's their authority? Is it God's Word or is, is it another book or a group of teachers? And if In both those cases, it's another book or group of teachers. What do they believe about human nature? What do they believe about us created in the image of God? Are we fully human? Will we become something else? Are we as sinful as the Bible describes us? Or are we basically good people? What do they believe about Jesus? Is Jesus fully God and fully man? Is Jesus part of the Trinity or is he not? Is the way of salvation by faith alone in the finished work of Jesus Christ, as Jason reminds us this morning, who 
died on the cross, was buried, and rose from the grave, and is coming back. See, if you just ask those basic questions, you're going to see that what they're teaching and peddling is not what the Bible teaches. If they take you away from the central message of the good news of Jesus, be wary. Now, maybe Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons are easier because their, their beliefs are, are, are really well known and, and, uh, and maybe easier to see. But if you just ask those basic questions when people are trying to distract you and take you away from the truth, it will recenter you. See, false teacher, teachers can be very slippery and deceptive. Number two, trait number two. False teachers do not practice what they preach. So they may say Jesus is King and Lord, but they don't live as if He is or, sh- or that He is their King or Lord. Look at verse 4 here. We're going to hit these kind of fast, so you might have questions about some of the detail in here, and if you do, we'd love to, to field those with you. So Peter writes, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others, and brought a flood upon the, the, the world of the ungodly, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them examples of what is going to happen to the ungodly, if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by sensual conduct of the wicked. For as the righteous man lived among them that day, day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over the lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. Let me just pause right there. So what Peter did there, he walked us through some Old Testament examples of true followers of God who were seeking to live a life that pleased God by faith and trusting Him, and then those who were living by their their passions and desires. He says, surely God, the holy God, creator of the universe, He will rightly judge those who are not living by the way God prescribes, which we know through the New Testament lens is by faith in Jesus Christ alone as our hope for this world and the world to come. But then he peels back the curtain a little bit more. On verse 10 he says, And especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority, bold and willful, They do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones. Whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. One of the common traits of false teachers is the way they live is contrary to what they say they believe. And so they may preach about holiness and living for the Lord, But in secret, in private, or sometimes just blatantly, they live contrary to that. That's not who you want to learn from. False teachers do not practice what they preach. Trait number three. False teachers are ruled by their sinful passions and desires. So this is very similar. See, when you become a Christian... God's Spirit comes inside of you, whether you are a teacher or not. You, God's Spirit comes inside of you, and that begins a lifelong journey of transformation where He actually changes us from the inside out. And so we should be changed and different. And then the Bible gives very high qualifications for those who are called to church leadership. And most of those qualifications are character-based. And so it is a major disconnect for somebody to say that they are a teacher of truth and to be living contrary to what they teach. Look at verse 12 and following. But these, these false teachers that we have to watch out for at times, are like irrational animals, 
creatures of instinct. So picture whatever creature of the night you might picture, and they're just like a raccoon eating your, your trash and just kind of feasting, and they're just, there's no control. They're just, they're just wild. Or think of you know, a number of us who live out in the country. There are coyotes. They are, they are creatures of instinct. They, they kill and eat and destroy, and, and they, that's what they do. Well, he's describing false teachers like this. Born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant. They will also be destroyed in their destruction. Suffering wrong as a wage for their wrongdoing. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime, to indulge in their sinful passions, even in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, major imperfections, reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. Hey, you might have heard that you know, Christians can't smoke weed or, or, or do this, but you know what? Let me show you a verse, a very obscure verse, that actually in the original language, this is what it really means. So I think it's okay to indulge. See, they are appealing to sinful passions and desires could be of a sexual nature could be of a financial nature could be all the combined he goes on to say they have eyes full of adultery insatiable for sin they entice unsteady souls and they have hearts trained in greed accursed children so if you come to church here a lot, if you're a part of the church, a member of the church, a regular attender, we don't preach passages like this very often. One of the reasons we like to preach through whole books of the Bible is because it forces us to preach the whole counsel of God, which we are fiercely committed to. But I want you to think that Peter is thinking, I'm about to die. And this is in the time of Rome and Nero's reign, and things were about to get really bad. And he's preparing them. And so he thought in his three-chapter inspired by the Holy Spirit letter that an entire chapter should be all about being aware of false teachers. So we would do good to pay attention to it. See, the sad thing is these false teachers, they, they prey on the weak and the unstable. They entice. They appeal. And just like this letter, they, they start with good things. There's a whole bunch of truth mingled in with a whole bunch of stuff that is really not true or unhelpful. And they, they can cause great disillusionment to Christians and great damage to the church of Jesus Christ. See, though they may claim Jesus as king of their life, by their lifestyle, we know that Jesus is not king of their life. I mean, when I think about this, I think of things like fake diamonds or, or fake gold. If I had a, I don't wear jewelry usually, but if I had a, a big chain, big gold chain on around my neck that from a distance looked like, man, that, that might have cost thousands of dollars. And you get up and you, you just see chips and cracks and you think, well, that's a, that's a fake. Or if I had diamond earrings um, and a big diamond ring on my hand, which is not my style. If that's your style, that's fine. But it's not my style. But if I had, and I've just got rocks right up here on the pulp, and I'm showing them to you. Well, you get closer and you think, I think they're all plastic. Well, that's what a false teacher who lives contrary to God's Word is like. They look like the real thing from a distance, especially from a distance. But as you get closer, you see that, oh, they're not the real thing. One of the things that's very sad is if you, if you follow any of the big Christian online sites that just kind of do news feeds of, of all kinds of different things, you can't go very far in time without seeing another ministry or Christian leader who has um, been corrupted by um, finances, some kind of sexual scandal, some kind of lording over other people. 
It's, it's all so rampant. And so when we teach these kind of things, one of the things we want to be very aware of is we, we don't want to go down these roads. We don't want to go down these roads as your pastors in, in our teaching. We don't want to teach something that's not true. And we certainly don't want to go down these roads in our character as well. It's why we like to pastor in a team, in a plurality, so that we can hold each other accountable, pray for each other. Uh, one of the things that, that we do when we preach is we send out our notes to one another so we can get other eyes on it. If something's not clear, it doesn't seem quite right, we, we challenge each other. Uh, one of the things I do personally that I'm doing right now is I went back to, to school. So I'm pursuing a master's degree right now online from Midwestern Seminary just to sharpen and keep centered in God's Word. And so tomorrow morning I begin Old Testament Survey 1. So pray for us. Pray that God would continue to grow us and keep us humble. See, all humans are, are vulnerable. And so we want to be honoring the Lord and living for Him. But you do not need to fear. Listen to what Galatians 5.13 says. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. We were called to freedom. When Jesus called you, he set you free. In the Bible that I read for my devotions every day, I write all kinds of notes on it. And I don't remember the exact, exact day that I became a Christian, but it was right around January 17th of 1996. So in my Bible this morning, um, I, every year I write how many years I've been a Christian, and just to thank the Lord. So I am on the 25th year of God setting me free from all kinds of sinful passions and desires as an IUP student. And see, God's Spirit came inside of me. And I, I wasn't perfect. I'm not perfect now. But I'm very different than I was then. And I immediately had freedom and power that I did not have before to turn from things that used to enslave and entangle me. And so that's the same for you. That's the same for anyone who calls on the name of Jesus. Trait number four. False teachers have veered from orthodox biblical truth. They go off the rails somewhere. Look at verse 15. False teachers, forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. So we're not the Lord. So we don't know the motives of everybody's heart. We don't know um, how they got to where they got to. We probably, those of us who have been Christians for a while, might all know people that, boy, they were really rock solid in their early days of teaching the Bible, and then they just went, whoop. Uh, I don't know why that happens. And, and then we have questions like, were they really a Christian? Were they not a Christian? I think a safe answer is, we don't know. But they're in a very dangerous spot right now if they're des denying Christ. And so... They veer off the truth. And they can veer in all kinds of ways. They can veer into the prosperity gospel that teaches that if you are a Christian, you will be healthy and wealthy. No matter what. Well, if you read the Bible, that's not the outcome for many Christians. If you read Hebrews chapter 11, the great hall of faith. I mean, some of them are martyrs. Some of them are just, life had gotten very difficult, and then they went to be with the Lord. And so they, they, they get off track. And often what happens is something more obscure becomes major, and it becomes their gospel rather than the gospel. So they might think of things that appeal to us, like um, hell's not real. Well, we all like that idea. I mean, I like that idea if that was true. The problem is it's not true. It's not what the Bible teaches. And so we have to submit to the Bible. Uh, maybe it's certain kinds of behavior are permissible, even though the Bible says that they're not. We have to submit to what God's Word says. 
See, there, there, it's always tempting to get away from the main, most important centerpiece of Christianity, which is Jesus alone. And you want that for your teachers, those you sit under, whether it's us here at a local church or those you follow online. Think, is Jesus and his glory and his honor what I'm all about? What that teacher is all about? Or are they taking us further and further away from the truth? Last night I watched this little clip from John Piper and he was thanking people for giving to the ministry of Desiring God and he's a well-known, faithful Bible pastor and he basically said, it was in his little study, he said, I've sat at the same desk for like 38 years and I've studied this book and I've sought to encourage people from this book. And he sought to be faithful and he sought to point people to Jesus and not veer off the path. Anytime you find yourself, okay, this is a new kind of Christianity. This is a new flavor of what it really means to be a Christian. I'd be very careful about that. Because for centuries, godly men and women have studied this book. And there are volumes of good uh, writings from this book that point us to the centerpieces of Jesus. So don't follow somebody who's veering off from orthodox biblical truth. See, this is nothing new. Do you remember in the book of Genesis, um, right before Adam and Eve sinned, Satan comes to Eve, and the first question he says is, did God really say? Did God really say that? Well, that, you know, was the first false teacher that derailed human, humankind. That God was only in control of all that, so we need not fear or worry about that. But it's not much different now. Stay tethered to God's Word. Remember that this is a book. It's actually 66 books put together as one book. It's a unique book. There is no other book like this. This book was written by the inspiration or literally the expiration of God as men penned what God put on their hearts and minds to write. He has preserved this book. This book is the book of all books. One of the things that confuses me is why Christians get so excited about other ideas and other things and other subjects that are not this book. Because I often think if you spent as much passion and energy and time in this book as you are in those other things, oh, you would be such an effective and influential Christian. Let's be students of this book. If you're newer to the church and you're trying to figure out what are these, what's this church all about? One of the things we're all about is God's Word. It's why we love Jesus so much because we learn so much about Him in God's Word. So we are committed to every part of this book. And the Bible can be confusing because sometimes we, we don't, probably most of us sit down and read a thousand plus page book for fun. Few of you do. Most of us don't. But remember, it's a book. So a book has an author. The author has a purpose. The author's writing with a certain kind of genre, a certain kind of style, so we can learn how to interpret the particular book by the style that it's written in. It has a beginning and an end. It has themes. It has primary points and purposes. And so you can get really far as you just approach the Bible that way. Then in addition to that, you have God's Holy Spirit in you. You say, Lord, help me to see and understand this book for the treasure that it is. And he will. So false teachers have veered from orthodox biblical truth. Pray for us. Pray for the other pastors in our area. We have a lot of wonderful pastors in our community. And we want to thank God for that. And pray for us collectively as well. Trait number five. False teachers are empty and shallow, contrary to their appearance. False teachers are empty and shallow, contrary to their appearance. They may appear very scholarly. 
They may appear extremely intelligent. They, they may appear that they have a line to the Lord that you could never have. And when they read this book, they have a different set of glasses than you could ever have. Be weary of those kind of teachers. The best kind of Bible teachers should be able to point to God's Word, show you, and you think, oh, I see that too. I see how he got there. That makes sense. I see how he followed the argument. He said Peter was going to die, and now he's writing these things that are on his heart, and now he's, he's, he's preserving them. He's building an argument. He has a couple major themes. You should be able to see it. If you're listening to teaching and you say, man, that guy's such a gifted speaker. He's so engaging. I have no idea what he's saying. That's not the kind of teaching you want to sit under. Because it will, help, it will take you away from center. You can be an extremely gifted communicator and a really bad or dangerous Bible teacher or pastor. Church history is filled with them at times. But listen to this. If this seems harsh that I'm saying false teachers are empty and shallow, contrary to their appearance, I'm getting that idea from verse 17. Peter says this. These are waterless springs. These false teachers, you know what they're like? They're waterless springs. They're like a well in a desert region that looks like a well, has a rope, has a bucket, but you know what it doesn't have? Has no water. That's what they're like. Or they're like a mist driven by a storm. So you see a rain cloud off in the distance, and it finally comes over. Not a drop comes onto your dry and arid soul. He says, for the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved for these. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. Peter doesn't have a lot of good things to say. I mean, imagine we don't live in a desert region, but if you lived in a desert region and it was a dry time and your family and your livestock and all that you have are on a journey for water and you see the well, hey, we found the well. Let's go, kids. Bring the cows, bring the lambs, bring everything. Lower the, the bucket, you pull it up, you dump it out, it's just a bucket of dirt. That's what false teaching does. It promises something that it cannot deliver. Be wary of false teachers that build into themselves and not into Jesus and not into his word. They're like a waterless spring. They're like a, a rain cloud that has no rain. And they entice. One of the themes that, that comes through this whole chapter is greed. Financial gain. Sadly, there are people that... that do ministries to get rich, to have jets, to have mansions, to have all kinds of things. And they, they, they're taking advantage of people. I mean, one of the, the things, I, I'm not a, even before I was a Christian, I, I'm not like a, I was never a fighter before as a Christian. I, I don't have that, that rage, anger kind of things. But I'll tell you one thing that does get me a little worked up is if ever I watch in, on like Christian television, especially late at night, when they'll, they'll appeal like this, they'll say, and there's a lot of good Christian television, by the way, but this is the bad side. They'll say something like, hey, imagine you're watching. Your son or daughter is enslaved to, to heroin or has been an alcoholic their whole life. And if you give $20 right now, that chain will be broken. That is wrong. That is sinful. That is manipulation. Jesus is the one who will set your son or daughter free, and you don't need to give 20 bucks to somebody to make that happen. Jesus is the only one. If you think this is strong, I want you to listen to Jesus' own words as he, taught, as he talked to the Pharisees. The Pharisees were, in Jesus' days, the, the waterless springs or the clouds without rain. This is what he said on several occasions to them. This is in Matthew 23. 
So he, he said this often to the, the scribes, the Old Testament lawyers, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. He said, but woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you shut the kingdom of heaven, you, sh- you shut the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. For you neither enter yourself nor allow those who would enter to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, waterless springs. You appear to be one thing that you're not. For you travel across the sea and land and make a single proselyte, a convert. And when he becomes a convert, you make him twice as much a child of hell as you yourselves. Now those words might not match well with the the happy painting of Jesus with the blue eyes that you might have grown up with looking at church, but Jesus was not messing around with false teachers that were confusing the men and women that he came to save. He goes on to say, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you tithe mint and dill and cumin. I I heard one pastor say, He's talking about somebody's spice rack. These religious people are so concerned. They they actually tithe. They give 10% of their spice rack. And you have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. See, a genuine pastor, a genuine teacher of God's Word should be concerned about justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. You blind guides straining out a gnat and swallowing a camel. Now, maybe a a version of this would be if you go to a church or you're listening to something online and the person speaking is much more concerned about what you're wearing, how many tattoos you have, what kind of piercings you have, what you look like, what kind of music you listen to, and they are all about the external. And what they're not about is loving you, and reaching you for Jesus. See, the reason Jesus was so whipped up about this, when he was on earth, he hung out with the worst of the worst. He had dinner with them. He, he socialized with them. He didn't participate in their things, but he went right to them, and he sat down with them because he came to rescue them. He goes on to say, I'll give you two more. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, Hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate so that the outside might be clean. See, the Pharisees were so concerned about the appearance of religion, but inside was corruption and decay and rot. And it's not just the Pharisees or modern-day pastors who can be guilty of these things. Any Christian can be vulnerable. And so if we have a major disconnect between our profession of Jesus and our life, we have good work to do. We want to confess those sins to the Lord and to others, and he will scrub us down and clean us up. Last one. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs which outwardly appear beautiful. This is a graphic one. But within are full of dead people's bones and uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. You know, the most harmful thing, or one of the most harmful things to the church of Jesus Christ is hypocrisy. I mean, it's why Jesus was so strong about it. I mean, probably all of us uh, know somebody who, who said, well, you know, I would follow Jesus, but Christians are just a bunch of hypocrites. I know so-and-so who grew up, you know, next to my grandma, and this is what they did, and this is what they said, and yet they were really uh, involved with their church, and it, it disillusions people. We don't want to be that. I don't want to be that. Our pastors here don't want to be that. And so we want to keep really short accounts with God and come clean and live before Him so that we can make disciples and reach the lost and participate in the kinds of things that we learned about last week. So watch out for the waterless springs of legalism, works-based salvation. Watch out for the 
waterless springs of enticement to your sinful passions and pleasures. There's no life there. See, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. All the life is found in Jesus. And lastly, to end our defensive practice for the the morning is trait number six. False teachers will answer to the Lord. For if they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to his own vomit, and the so the pig, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. God does not take lightly when his, his kids are messed with, when, especially when, when people from inside local churches seek to cause damage and trouble and problems. And so the Lord will not be mocked. He will care for us. We need not fear that. Jesus is the king. He's the risen king that we sang about. He's the returning king. So we don't have to fear the future. We don't have to fear future events in any way. We can have great confidence and complete certainty that Jesus will come back for his bride. So let's all stand. We're going to pray as a church and the worship team can come back up. Jesus, thank you. You are our protector. You are our king. You are our hope. You are our confidence. You are the good shepherd. You're the true shepherd. You're the only perfect pastor and leader. And we seek to humbly follow you, submit to you, obey you, and live for you. Lord, we pray you would protect every local church in our county, in our region, We pray you raise up many, many faithful pastors who preach your word so that you would receive glory, who preach your word so that the the lost would be found, the dead would be raised, and disciples would be made. Lord, we, we ask that you would protect and deliver us from all evil, and we will give you all the glory. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.